77 people, of course, have been charged following protests at three printing presses across the UK. Protesters targeted presses which print the Rupert Murdoch own titles, including The Sun, The Times, The Sun on Sunday, The Sunday Times and The Scottish Sun. More than 100 Extinction Rebellion activists use vehicles and bamboo structures to blockade roads outside newsprinters printing works in Broxbourne, Hertfordshire and Knowlesley near Liverpool. Protesters have faced significant criticism after the political sphere for impeding the freedom of the press. In response, Home Secretary Priti Patel has said the activists should face the full force of the law for pursuing guerrilla tactics that seek to undermine and cause damage to our society. Let's speak with James Dellingpole, writer and columnist, often sceptical about some of these things, and Tim Crossland, a legal representative for Extinction Rebellion. Um, afternoon to you both. Tim, firstly... Um, I was I understood uh, last year when Extinction Rebellion were mounting some very disruptive protests. I didn't agree with everything that was going on, but I could see what they were doing. When you cross that line in trying to choke off the free press, do you think you lose the room? I think we completely agree that a cornerstone of democracy is access to good information. That's absolutely critical. Um, but two examples of how the billionaire press are, are denying people to access good information um, one, Sir David King, the government's former chief scientist and special envoy on climate change, he told us how he wanted to go public on his report that revealed the devastating impacts of the climate crisis and was blocked from doing that by a special advisor at number 10 out of fear of re retaliation from the Murdoch press. In January, we saw how the Murdoch press tried to portray the devastating wildfires in Australia, which took human life, displaced so many people, killed so many animals, devastated Australia, tried to portray it as the act of arsonist. That was misinformation. It was inconsistent with all the science. And James Murdoch was so disgusted, he walked away from um, his family over that. It was only on Friday that I read a story in the newspaper that said, in the Times, that said blazes from the Arctic to the Amazon show the threat of global warming. And I was looking into this and I, I, I found... I mean, I won't go through them all, Tim, but I could give you about 200 headlines from that same company. And that they all are all similarly informative, covering huge issues, very important issues. And there doesn't seem to be there any kind of agenda. So it's absolutely true that The Times has shifted from promoting climate denial through Matt Ridley, which it did for, for many, many years. But well, what that's, that's, one, that's one voice in a newspaper, of course. But what it is failing to do now, as we see billions of public funds going to bail out uh, uh, fossil fuel companies, what we don't see is the time saying, what is going on? Why is the government ignoring the scientific advice? Why is it ignoring the economic advice, which says we must give that money instead to creating the billions of, of new jobs in the clean economy that is needed right now? Why doesn't it hold the government to account for that? James Dellingpoll, uh, you're a writer and a columnist. You've written for many titles. You heard what Tim just said there. The press are yeah. uh, essentially lacking in their, their responsibility here. Yeah, it's the familiar hard left litany, because let's not make any, uh, let's not be under any illusion. Uh, Extinction Rebellion is another branch of the radical left bent on global societal change, which most of us, I think, don't really want. We all want a cleaner planet. We all want the polar bears to thrive, which they are, by the way. The populations are not declining. Uh, what we don't need is what is what Tim calls uh, good information, which is actually just eco propaganda. He mentions, for example, the the fires in Australia, which which actually got enormous coverage, contrary to his claims in, uh, in the media, got enormous coverage, and they were completely misrepresented by, by the, the radical green left, the eco-fascists, as being somehow the result of climate change. Actually, they were much more likely the result of, of misguided green policy, whereby instead of allowing uh, landowners to clear the, the, the fallen branches around their, their, their 
trees. They, they were left in their natural state so that beetles could live underneath them. Uh, unfortunately, this also had the added uh, side effect, the unfortunate side effect of allowing the, you know, when the, when the, the bushfire started, to, uh, causing much more widespread damage. So it was kind of the green movement being hoist by its own petard. The, the, uh, as for the idea that, that somehow the media is not reporting on environmentalism, on the contrary, on the very day that Extinction Rebellion tried to shut down the newspapers, the Sun, the, the Murdoch Press, was running yet another piece by eco-evangelist David Attenborough on how the world is doomed. We get nothing but eco-propaganda from the media. And this word climate denial, that sounds very much to me like Holocaust denial. Nobody denies that climate changes. I think it's very sinister to tarnish people who question the environmental uh, uh, narrative as deniers. Tim, can you respond to that? Because I think within that uh, monologue from James uh, was a suggestion here really that you guys are playing the very same game that you're attacking you have your own agenda which might be misguided according to some and you want to see that in print rather than somebody else's well it's yeah it was very interesting to hear james describe us as hard left just before i joined extinction rebellion i was a legal advisor for the serious organized crime agency and the national crime agency and was involved in the government's strategy on organized crime um, and the legislation on organized crime and i can tell you one thing Never crossed my mind as we were working on that, that was going to be used against the tens of thousands of ordinary people, the frontline workers, the nurses, the doctors, the prime minister's own father, Stanley Johnson, in an attempt to tarnish these ordinary people as organized criminals. It's an extraordinary thing. Exile is a broad coalition of people who are standing up for nothing else but their right to life. But, uh, and uh, at the, the core, to... though, Tim, at the core, there is a kind of a suggestion that this is a sort of a lefty Trotskyite organisation, which when you push away the Stanleys and the various others and the Conservatives that might have stood out there last year on the streets of the capital and elsewhere, when you get right to the centre of it all, much like like Black Lives Matter and other organisations, what you guys are looking for is a fundamental change in the entire system. What we're looking for is the upholding of the social contract and the thing that binds all of us together and binds us together as a people, and it crosses all parts of the political spectrum, is our desire to survive and to pass on the flame of life undimmed. That is a common concern of all of us. To describe it as political or leftist is, is just a, a cynical attempt to divide us. It's, it's incredible. J James, come back on that. James Dellingpole. The, there was a report, it's interesting, there was a, a report produced last year by Richard Walton, the former head of the Metropolitan Police's Counter-Terrorism Command. And he said... Those encountering Extinction Rebellion should be under no illusions about just how destabilizing and extremist their agenda is. Not only is it unclear how their three formal demands could be realistically satisfied, but it also appears unlikely that their actions would end even if government committed to trying to implement. Them. This is this is a, a Marxist revolution organization using using green issues as as a kind of a cover for for their very destabilizing and radical aims. They're talking about I mean, they remind me a bit of, of the French revolutionaries. They talk about about one of their demands is that we should have citizens assemblies. I mean, presumably a sort of parallel government by the mob. Uh, they, 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 these are not cosy bunny huggers. These are, they may have persuaded a few gullible trustafarian kids and public school people who feel guilty about their affluence. I mean, it is a predominantly white middle class movement. They may have persuaded themselves that all they're about is saving the planet, but they're not. They're about, about radical change, which I don't think most people in, in Britain or the world would want. Tim Crossland, do you, do you recognise none of that, even put, putting aside your own backstory and, and one or two others that James Dellingpole alludes to? Do you do, do you recognise that there is a core contingent, some would say the very beating heart of Extinction Rebellion, that is hell-bent on fundamental change, that isn't just about the environment, it's about our economy, it's about our system of government, it's about the role that uh, government will play, it's about the role of the police, it's systematic, fundamental, top-to-bottom, root-and-branch change. 
It is really interesting to hear uh, James bring up that policy exchange report because we were asking journalists at the time, why don't you ask where policy exchanges funding has come from? Because that's the question, because it's well known policy exchanges are not. obscure about its funding. And the answer came out through Vice, Vice magazine, large amounts of policy exchanges funding come from big oil. And nobody reported on right. that. And it's just completely right. untrue. I pro I, I'm in the middle of Extinction Rebellion. It's an incredibly broad range of people. It is doctors, it's nurses, it's ordinary working people, it's grandparents, it's lawyers. To brand them as all Trotskyites is McCarthyism. This is what's sinister. James, really are, you, are you on a witch hunt, James Ellingpole? Nobody's, Final point. This is, this is, nobody's branding you all as, all as Marxists or... Trotskyites, just the hard, the hardcore. I think you've persuaded a lot of gullible, well-meaning idiots to join your, join your, your revolution, and they don't know what they're doing. But at its hardcore, I would say that this is a very nasty extremist organisation which engages in economic terrorism. I mean, the damage you've caused to the livelihoods of Londoners and beyond, you've caused endless misery. I mean, I think of the story uh, a year or two back when you blocked somebody from going to visit their dying father in hospital. There's footage the other day of you stopping an ambulance getting to a hospital. People do not need this kind of economic terrorism. I think it's very unpleasant. And I think you should be called out for the monsters that you are at your core. Oh, an uh, ugly organisation. Okay. J J on that point, I am bound to give you a final response to that, Tim Crossland. It's an ugly organisation. You should be feeling guilty. Well, it's an ugly organisation if it's ugly to stand up for life and if it's ugly to stand up for the people around us in solidarity and the hundreds of thousands of people who are dying around the world already, not just in this country, but in, oh, really? in other places too. Um, we've got one. to put a stop to it. The deaths from air pollution... The, the greater disease that is spread as our ecosystems are destroyed. Um, that's what we are. We're people who are standing up for life and standing okay. up for our right to pass it on to the next generation. On that point, Tim Crossland, thank you. Legal representative for Extinction Rebellion. The other voice you heard was James Dellingpole, the columnist and writer. Uh, where do you nail your, uh, your colours on that 